achieved. I don't envy the uh, the jobs of the UFC matchmakers or any matchmaker for that for that uh, uh, matter. At the same time, it would be a heck of a lot of fun to have the entire UFC roster at your disposal to start putting matchups together and putting fights together. We know we've done fantasy matchmaking before, whether it be with video games or I've posted articles online where you said, "Well, what if we did this fight in this fight?" Or you know, you know, it's a lot of fun. It is, but at the same time, there's a lot of pressure. And Alan Joban brings up an excellent point heading into this weekend's fight. He's been on a pretty good streak of late, won a lot of fights, only had a few setbacks. He has been calling for a top 15 opponent. He's finally getting him in the number nine ranked Gunnar Nelson. Great, great matchup. Very much looking forward to it. I'll predict that in, in, in a little bit. But at the same time, now you've got the man that Alan Joban just defeated, Mike Perry. Joban outclassed him over three rounds. Perry had his moments, but it was still clearly a Joban victory. And Alan Joban is upset because now Mike Perry, coming off a loss, is also getting a ranked opponent. Yes, it's the number 12th ranked Jake Ellenberger, but at the same time, it sends a bad precedent saying, here you've got a guy who's winning fights and beating other prospects back or beating other, you know, unranked fighters back to finally get that shot, and he turns around and sees the man he just defeated also getting an opportunity to top 12 guy. That's very, I, I'd be very difficult to take for a fighter, and I, and I understand, you know, you, you have to make fights. The way I look at it is if you're ranked and you're winning, you're fighting guys, you probably should be fighting guys that are ranked above you moving up if that's available. I know, you know, it's not always available. There's a lot of scenarios out there that prevent, you know, those matches from happening. And then the second way I look at it is if you were, you know, I know that UFC likes to pair together losers and, you know, come, two guys coming off losses. But at the same time, I, I look at it and say this. Jake Ellenberger, you're coming off a loss as a ranked fighter. You are going to be fighting an unranked fighter who is coming off a win, who's earned that opportunity to steal your spot. And if you deserve to remain in the rankings, you'll win that fight. If they deserve to take your spot, they'll win that fight. For Perry, I feel he should be fighting somebody who's in a similar situation, unranked fighter coming off a loss. So it's, it's kind of one of those things. I know styles make matchups, and they try and you know put fights together that are exciting. But at the same time, I think they have to do a little bit better of a job of watching those scenarios and not sending the wrong message to the fans and to their fighters. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson. Well, and on this episode of the show, we're breaking down the upcoming UFC Fight Night 107, which will take place at the O2 Arena in London, England on um, shoot March 18th, featuring four main card fights, which I'll be breaking down for you on this episode of the show. All of my preliminary picks available at kamikazeoverdrive.net, so certainly check that out. Uh, this is an afternoon event for where I live, so depending on where you live, of course, it's uh, we're fighting over in London, so the time there's a bit of a time difference, so make sure you don't miss the card, or at least record it so you can watch it later. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. I'm coming off a 6-5 and five night. I won the final three fights of the night, but I had a couple of losses that really hurt. The turn all the loss did not help. But, and and, and there, but that wasn't the three key. Tim Means, Hani Yaya, and uh, Juicy Formiga all going down to defeat all three big fights. A lot of people were backing those guys, and I was on the wrong end of all three of them, and that ultimately shut my night down for having a profitable night. We won a little bit of money. We didn't break even, unfortunately. We've had two back-to-back -back bad nights. We're looking to rebound here. Uh, this is the last fight for a couple of weeks, so definitely going to put a lot of work in here so I can kind of go into that break on a, on a high note, even more work than normal if I have that opportunity. And uh, so, yeah, certainly head over to the website, kamikazeoverdrive.net, check out the bet packs, 15 bucks for the entire bit breakdown of the event, props, parlays, fantasy picks, betting scenarios with stats that I keep on all those scenarios, all kinds of fun stuff. On that note, let's get to the first main card prediction. We open things up in the UFC's featherweight division as almighty Alan Arnold of England, certainly the fan favorite in this fight, 11 wins and 1 loss, will take on Mr. Finland, Makwan Amir Khani, with a current record of 13 wins and 2 defeats. Now, Alan is on a 4-fight winning streak, including 2 wins inside the UFC. He hasn't fought in almost 13 months. Months He withdrew from an October fight with Mirsad Bektik, who we just saw. We know what happened with Mirsad, so he's certainly licking his wounds. For Amir Khani, he has also won four fights in a row, three of those fights coming in the octagon. He fought actually at the same event that Alan last fought at, so he's coming off a 13-month layoff as well. So very good match, making two fighters in similar situations looking to advance their position. Amir Khani, two inches taller, over two-inch reach advantage, but the Brit is the younger man by six years. Uh, now, looking at how their numbers break down, Allen has five wins by knockout, 3-0 and in fights ended by submission, and 3-1 and in the scorecards. For Amir Khani, just a single knockout victory, 9-1 and in fights ended by submission, 3-1 and on the scorecards. Now, Allen has spent a lot of time recently at TriStar Gym, certainly looking to hone his skills. He's a very young fighter, so he's in constant development, constant progression, which is very important for a young guy at this stage, and to be fighting guys who can really beat you up and show you what, what level you need to get to. 
in this situation, the layoff certainly could bring some ring rush, but for a young guy like him, it could also create a lot of time for development. Looking back at his in-ring performance, when he debuted, he debuted on short notice, he arguably lost his first the first two rounds against Alan Omer before snatching up a sub early in the third round. I said he took that fight on short notice. What he likes to do, and there's a couple different things he likes to do, but of course he's an evolving fighter, so it sometimes can be difficult, but he really does well when he can bully his opponent from in, you know to the floor from the clinch position. He uses nice trip takedowns. We saw that against Meza when he put him on the ground, and a lot of top position strikes once he gets there. He was taken down by Omer on a couple occasions, he made a couple positional mistakes, including he had his back almost. He was kind of floating, trying to ride his back, and, and Omer slipped out and took his back. He eventually did get the choke when Omer shot for a takedown in the third round, which was an impressive comeback. Uh, defensively, we saw some not so bad takedown defense in his last matchup. He did a good job when his opponent shot in, getting his hips back, you know, forcing them, putting his shoulders down, and lowering his level to keep them from getting in deep. Uh, you know, and he has heavy hips too. If you if you shoot in on the guy and he can get his hips in the right position, he can turn that into a positive position for himself. When he's striking on the feet, uses quick flurries at distance, looks to close that gap. He did struggle to match Omer's output, which was certainly concerning. He'll throw a decent left hook or a straight left. He'll mix in a left uppercut as well. He throws a lot of jabs from the right side, and he throws, you know, his kicking arsenal is not bad, usually going to the body or the head. I don't like the way he tends to duck his head while, and swing wildly when he's under fire. That's something that, that extra time off could clean up, but I wouldn't be surprised to see that in this fight. Certainly opens him up against a better striker to either counter or change with a strike or change levels for a takedown. Uh, he did look improved in his last fight on the feet from his debut, so that's good. For Amir Khani, he's a former Finnish uh, champion in Greco-Roman wrestling, so we know what kind of background he's coming from. He's a very aggressive grappler. He will give up position for submission, but he's very crafty on the mat, and he chains submissions together until something sticks. So he's very exhaustive on the mat when you're fighting, you know, dealing with his pressure and constant movement. On his shot, he's shown very good timing, looking to, you know, either punch and attack, shoot, or wait for his opponent to attack, like, for example, on a kick, and he'll dive on a single leg and drive them to the ground. Once he gets tied up with his opponent, look for him to actually try and transition to the back. He has a very good rear naked choke. Uh... So it's one of those guys, he's constantly looking to, you know, the next move ahead. He's not just looking for a takedown and then where do I go from there? It's a takedown and then maybe I'm rotating to the back and looking to set up a rear naked choke. It's a single leg, elevate, drive, and float over into half position. Uh, he, you know, he's, like I said, he's always looking for the takedown. He can shoot from way out. He gets opponents to react to his jab and shoot. And I like that technique. Anytime a fighter will use their hands to set up their takedowns, very effective, very nice to see. Uh, for example, when he fought Wilkinson, even when Wilkinson sprawled out and was in a good position to defend... Uh, Amir Khani shot. Amir Khani was able to eventually push forward and just plant him on his back. On the mat, very quick positional advancements. He floats exceptionally well, maintains top position, tight body control when he wants to. Will allow them to kind of move in order to you know corral them into a submission position that he likes. Very quick mount. He does an excellent job of getting that you know top you know aggressive top uh, body position and then slips that knee across belly and gets in the mount. Big ground and pound, good elbows as well. Now, when he fought Wilkinson, he did spend some time on his back in the third round. Seemed to be tiring down a little bit. Uh, he was able to tie him up for the most part and limit his offense from top position. Eventually, he swept him. He showed good sub uh, defense when Wilkinson did go for a submission and eventually worked himself into superior position. And that's something if you can bait a guy into going for something, knowing you can defend it and work that position into a better spot for you, that's huge. He has exceptionally long limbs, which makes him very difficult to control on the mat. Even when he's tired, he's hard to handle. We haven't seen a heck of a lot of striking. Out of Amir Khani, you know, he focused, he's more focused on his wrestling mainly. We did see that flying knee again, an uppercut to take out uh, Andy Ogle, score the only knockout of his career. Uh, overall, though, the layoff could create ring rust on both sides. It could create chances for you know, improvements and opportunities on, to, to get better on both sides. But ultimately, I think Arnold's going to struggle with the wrestling attack and sweeps Amir Khani. Even when Arnold looks to implement his own wrestling game, I think Amir Khani's going to get the better of it. I think he's going to take him down. He's going to wear him out. And my prediction is Makwan Amir Khani to defeat Alan Arnold by submission. The second fight on the main card is in the UFC's uh, Bantamweight division is a very special matchup as we feature the final fight of One Punch Brad Pickett's career, 26 wins and 13 losses. He's taking on short notice injury replacement Marlon Chito Vera with a current record of 8 wins and 3 losses and 1 draw. Now, so this is Pickett's retirement fight. He actually just fought Uriah Faber in Faber's retirement fight, so this is his opportunity to go out on a high note at home in front of his cr uh, home crowd. For Vera, he is replacing Henry Baronis on short notice i don't know if it's, I think it's less than two weeks i believe uh vera overall has alternated wins and losses over his last six fights he is coming out the second time he's fought in london the last time he fought davy grant and lost i think it was a decision he might have got submitted in that matchup actually 
Uh, Pickett has lost two fights in a row and five of six. He is certainly whining on his career against top level competition, but not having a lot of success. And that only win in that span was a controversial split decision over Jorge, or sorry, Francisco Rivera. Uh, physically very two inches taller, he'll have a two inch reach advantage, and he is the younger man by 14 years. So that shows you Pickett is at a point where he probably needs to walk away. Vera from Ecuador, BJJ Brown Belt, five submission wins, active off his back, will pull guard, willing to you know give up that position to to go on the offensive. He did so against Davy Grant, really didn't work out for him, but he can he's a dangerous grappler. Uh, when he fought Grant, Grant, he did have some success. He grabbed a single leg at one point in the first round, immediately rotated to back uh, to a back control and locked in the body lock. Had some opportunities to rear naked choke. Very similar to uh, Amir Khani. He's got long limbs, and he's very good at locking in you know, that body triangle to neutralize your opponent and go to work with submissions. Uh, unfortunately, against off of his back when he was eventually taken down, Grant beat it, busted him up. He had a lot of success in the feet, Grant did, really hurting him, and that took away some of his you know, umph on the mat. Uh, in other fights, for example, Roman Salazar had a lot of success taking him down early before getting submitted. Uh, Gyung Yu also held top position and was able to control him from that spot, you know, worked the mount, landed some ground. I think he actually had full mount at one point was landing some big ground and pound. So again, Vera capable on the ground, certainly not impossible, though, to get the better of him. On the feet, he moves fairly well, throws pretty long punches, mixes in some kicks. He will throw a flying knee, good st uh, step in straight right uh, left hand. He did actually knock out the man he's replacing, Henry Baronis, on his season of the Ultimate Fighter. When he fought Gong Yu in his last matchup, an upset that I picked, he actually landed a nice left jab to drop him through some good body kicks. Uh, front kick to the body as well, which I really, really like that technique when you're a longer guy and keep fighters on the outside. He threw a nice left jab, right body kick combination. Again, not a lot of combinations, not a high volume striker by any stretch of the imagination, but still he can mix it up fairly well. Now looking at Brad Pickett, he comes in with 10 wins by submission. He's also been submitted five times, which is certainly worth noting against an aggressive grappler like Vera. He is 8-6 and six in the scorecards, 7 wins by knockout, 2 losses by KO. You know, his stats are concerning. He tends to get hit a lot more than he actually hits his opponents. 1.67 strikes more per minute that he gives up than he actually lands. He's willing to take a punch to land one. And unfortunately, you know, he's willing to stand in there and scrap. He prefers offense over defense, but it appears to be catching up with him as he's been rocked in several matchups. Uriah Faber hurt him and nearly finished him early in that fight. He was hurt and finished by both uh, Thomas Almeida and Uriel Contra. And those are matchups where, again, he's fighting high-level guys, but it's just his durability isn't there anymore. The question is, where does Vera fit into that equation? Uh, when, Vera, when Pickett is doing his best, he keeps his hands up, he moves his head well. I like the way he starts low and looks to rise up during combinations and really catch an opponent with that level, with that you know field of view change. Uh, he threw a nice low calf kick, and they really talked about that against Faber. He only threw it a couple of times, but it landed. It did do damage, and against a very tall, lanky fighter like Vera, whose wrestling is not bad, but Pickett should, I would think Pickett should be able to handle it. He'll, that kick will be there to do some damage and really take some of that steam off of what Vera has to offer. 58% takedown defense for Pickett. He has, you know, and the, and the wrestling really has been a toll of, has been a key factor in his fights. In his set, last seven wins, he has landed 28 takedowns and given up eight. As a plus 20 differential for the Brit. In the other scenario, his last nine losses, he has landed four takedowns and given up 13. That's minus nine. So you can see how important it is that he gets the better of the wrestling. Coming off the Faber loss, seeing Faber go out on top like that, I think Pickett, well, he would be motivated anyway. He'll be motivated to come in here and do the best he can in front of his Brits to come out with a win and finish his career on a high note. Short notice fight Rivera. He has had some gas tank issues in the past, especially if he spends time on his back and Pickett can beat on him early. That's not going to be a good thing later in that fight. It should cost him some, you know, some big points in the round. Vera certainly looking to spoil the party. I don't know if he's going to be able to. I like the fighter here, and I really, it's a, there, it's a close to the line fight. I think it's going to be a tough matchup. Pickett needs to use his wrestling, keep his volume consistent, outwork Vera, keep him backing up. Do not allow him to dictate the pace on the feet. For Vera, he needs to find success off his back if he's taken down, really be aggressive. Look to catch Pickett with a power. Maybe one of those jumping knees that he throws, that's something he could look to land to really change the course of the matchup. Ultimately, I think Pickett gets the job done here. I think he's going to use his wrestling at home in front of you know that crowd. He's going to be motivated to do well. I think his volume, and I think we're going to see Vera slow down as this fight hits rounds two and three, and that'll be big for Pickett. It might be a controversial decision. Pickett needs to avoid, obviously, getting taking some big damage. But my prediction is Brad Pickett to defeat Marlon Vera by decision. 
in the co-main event of the evening. It's the fight we were talking about briefly in the uh, intro to the show. The number nine ranked gunner, Gunny Nelson of Iceland. 15 wins, two losses, and one draw. Takes on Alan Brahma Joban with a current record of 15 wins and four losses. These two going at it in the welterweight division. Obviously, Joban looking to crack the top 15. Gunner looking to continue his pace onward and upward. Now, Joban, as he said in the preview, he's looked exceptionally well You know, in recent fights. He's looked done very well. He's been asking for a top 15 opponent, finally getting it, and then angry. I know I want to see him focusing on this matchup, but angry and upset to see uh, Perry getting an opportunity to fight a top 15 opponent coming off a loss to Joe Ben. And so it's, you know, it's only three spots. You know, that's really not a, it's very difficult, I'd say, for Joe Ben. He needs, still needs to be focused here. Now, Joe, uh, you look at Nelson, actually, he has alternated wins and losses over his last five matchups. He has a first, he came off his first career loss to Rick Story. Followed it by taking out Brandon Thatch, lost to Damian Maya, who obviously is on the cusp of a title shot, took out Albert Tumanoff in the last fight and upset I correctly predicted. Uh, physically, Joban, one inch taller, one inch reach advantage. Nelson is the younger man by seven years. They do have a common opponent, as I mentioned, Albert Tumanoff. Nelson submitted him in round two, where Alan Joban got knocked out by him. So MMA math would suggest this fight is going to be all Gunnar Nelson all day long. We don't use MMA math here, just stating a fact. Uh, Nelson melds together a very uh, that karate style, very unique karate style striking, and that exceptionally talented BJJ and wrestling game. Not a high volume takedown guy. He's landed two takedowns as his career best in the UFC against Jorge Santiago earlier in his UFC career, and then in the two men off fight as well. He makes the most of takedown opportunities. When he takes you down, you are in trouble because you are staying there for the most part. He looks for submissions. He beats you up with some ground and pound, and eventually either finishes the round on top or finishes you before the round finishes. Finish, finish, finish. Uh, he has a variety of takedown opportunities, or takedown techniques, which I like. He uses that clinch and inside fight. He's used a body lock. We saw it against two men off, you know, closing in, using that body lock and pushing him over with momentum. Just overall, a lot of nice techniques to take his opponent down. Once on the ground, he's a smotherer. Works elbows from top position. He's always working towards that submission, looking to break you down, and he, he really loves that back mount. He's trying to beat guys up from top position to force them to roll over, give up their back. He's got five wins by rear naked choke, plus a, a neck crank as well, which you know falls into the same category. He's looking to force you to turtle up and get that submission. Now, he is a capable striker as well. We saw him drop Brandon Thatch, another upset I picked. Uh, he also dropped Omari Akhmedov prior to submitting both of those guys. He switches stances. He threw a nice one-two versus two men off. He's looking to draw the Russian into that into that fight, draw him in to attack, and then change levels for a takedown. So he melds his offense together very effectively. He throws some nice kicking techniques, front leg side kick, good head movement overall. He works in and out. Good left hook as well. The, now, on the negative side, I don't like the way he holds his hands low. And that kind of goes hand-in-hand hand with that attempt, hand-in-hand. Hand. Um to bait an opponent in. Here, my hands are down, come attack me. I'm going to change levels, and I'm going to shoot. My hands are already down, looking for your waist, or looking for a single leg or a double leg when you come forward. But still, he holds his hands low. He's taking some, absorbing some hard leg kicks versus Rick Story. He's very calm on the feet. That can almost get him in trouble if he's taking too much damage. He took some big shots in that matchup. He slowed down, was actually getting outworked. He got hurt in, uh, I think it was the fourth round, Story did clip him and put him on a seat. So certainly, he can be hit. But it took a while for, for Story to turn that fight in his favor. Now looking at Alan Joban, he has power. Does a lot of the best his best work in close range along the cage. He took out Richard Walsh with elbows in tight. He landed a head kick against Brennan O'Reilly along the wall as well. He's a fairly capable distance striker. I would say it's improved. I wasn't sold on him initially from at range, but he certainly has come a long way. And I, I really like the number of kicks he came out throwing against Perry. He was trying to keep that fight kicking range to stay away from Perry's power, powerful hands, throwing a lot of body kicks, a lot of head kicks early on, trying to maybe compromise that cardio, both round kicks and push kicks down the middle. Very good techniques. With his hands, we saw him drop Bilal Muhammad with a right hand. He also landed a brutal head kick. Muhammad showing off a chin in that fight very impressively. On the flip side, Joe Ban's chin, bit of a question mark. He's been hurt in several fights. Seth Bozinski, Warley Alves, Gore, uh, Dwyer, Perry, all hurt him. Two men off obviously stopped him, but all those other guys were able to do enough damage to at least either wobble him or put him on his butt. You know, he's got two knockout losses overall, so certainly there's that question. If he gets cracked flush, almost turned that fight around in the first round, hurt him and had him backing up and really took control of that matchup. Couldn't get the finish. Joe Ban, you know, showed a lot of uh, heart, recomposed, got the victory. When two men off though had success, he was pressuring Perry, or sorry, pressuring Joe Ban and backing him up, and Joe Ban really had no answer to mitigate that pressure. 
and that's something we'll see. I know Gunnar Nelson's not a pressure guy. He's looking to counter, but still we'll see if you know his ability to move forward is going to cause some problems for Alan Joban. Now, as far as wrestling is concerned, we ha- it hasn't been an issue for Joban in the UFC. We haven't seen a lot of guys come out and look to take him down. At the same time, he hasn't taken a lot of guys down either, so we'll see, obviously, with Gunnar Nelson, how that holds up. I've seen times pre-UFC where he's really been willing, he's given up takedowns and been too willing to sit on his back and hasn't been able to do anything about it. And against Gunnar Nelson, if you give up takedowns, that round's lost, potentially the fight is lost. You know, the key so far to beating Gunnar has been two things. Two guys, Maya implemented, it was able to outgrapple him. Few people can outgrapple Damian Maya. Jake Shields was one of them, surprisingly. But we saw Maya get the better of Gunnar Nelson on the mat. Rick Story took him five rounds, piled up on it heck of a lot of damage took advantage of that lackadaisical style you know simply landing more impactful strikes and got the nod over five you know very closely fought rounds i would say for joe band to win this matchup he needs to keep the fight standing he needs to hurt nelson make him pay for holding his hands low throwing kicks certainly one of his more effective techniques but it's also going to create takedown opportunities for gunner and I think the other thing that with Nelson or with Joe Ban, one of his other strengths, clinch fighting, that's where Nelson can land takedowns either in the clinch or as Joe Ban comes forward trying to initiate the clinch, he can put him on his back. If Joe Ban's focused on defending takedowns, it will open up holes for Gunner to strike. Joe Ban's chin's a major question mark as well. I think Nelson will either drop him or score a takedown when Joe Ban moves forward. Work to Nelson to defeat Alan Joe Ban by submission. In the main event of the evening, we move to the UFC's light heavyweight division as the number four ranked Jimmy, the poster boy, Manawa, 16 wins and two losses. It takes on the seventh ranked Corey, newly named Overtime Anderson, currently working record of 10 wins and two losses. I believe he took his beasting 24, was it 20? I can't remember, but it was implying he was working overtime and he realized maybe overtime's a better nickname, less ridiculous. I like it. Huge fight for both men. Light heavyweight division is looking for new contenders. Obviously, these guys are both ranked in the top 10. Winner of this fight will get a push to the next level. Obviously, you know, they've had their setbacks, but certainly no one's perfect. And, you know, the opportunity to win these fights and get to that next level is certainly on the table. Manuel's only lost the elite guys. Speaking of not being perfect, losing to Rumble Johnson, losing to Gus uh, Gustafson, two guys that have beat him. Everybody else he's beaten back. For Corey Anderson, he lost to Gian Vellante and a very tough F- split decision to Shogun Hua, who just beat Gian Vellante. Uh, they have one common opponent, Jan Blakovich. Both guys won by decision, so certainly, you know, some commonalities there. So this should be a draw then, based on MMA math. No, uh, Anderson six foot three. He's two inches taller than Manoa. Same reach. I think it's seventy nine inches. And the American is nine years younger than his opponent. Manoa comes in this matchup having won fourteen of sixteen fights by knockouts. So you know what he's all about. Both losses also by KO. He can generate a lot of power in short distances, do a heck of a lot of damage, and really put it on guys. You could see how discouraged Ovin St. Preux was in that last matchup. An upset I pre- predict uh, correctly predicted. How discouraged he was every time Manoa landed and backed him up. With with Jimmy, he commits everything on his punches, digs to the body exceptionally well. That left hook throws a variety of kicks, front leg kicks, side kicks. He has good head movement, willing to stand in there and trade. And his overall is very dangerous. He will stalk his opponents, throws a lot of single strikes on the outside. As I said, that left hook to the body, those kicks, he'll throw single strikes, looking to close the distance to let his combina- combinations rip, or get in the clinch where he can land knees and elbows. As I said, he's a good, a good clinch fighter. Those knees, again, they can be devastating because he holds you, frames you, and then turns that knee over and drives it right into your midsection, and that really knocks your wind out of you, knocks that desire to continue fighting. And again, we saw him break down OSP with that. He did get hurt by Gustafson and finished in close. He had a lot of success controlling Blakovitz on the cage in his short knees and short punches and really won that fight in that position, uh, large chunks of that fight from that position. Against OSP, though, you know, Ovin St. Preux had some success backing him up to the cage, pinning him there, but again, Manawat was landing those knees. You're going to hold me here, you're going to pay for it, and that's something he needs to do in this match if Corey Anderson looks to employ something similar. The cardio has been a bit of a question mark for the Brit. He certainly looked better against Blakovitz, fighting on all three rounds. Other fights where he slowed down a little bit. He's had a lot of quick fights. So you wonder, in a grueling matchup, this is a five-round matchup, how will he hold up in the later stages if we get there? When he fought OSP, going back to that matchup, because that was a high-level guy that he defeated, at least in the rankings, he was landing brutal hard body kicks. He was breaking OSP down along the cage, again, with those knees to the body. And, you know, he was also attacking the head. He basically turned OSP into a stationary target by hurting him and taking away his cardio. OSP did take him down early, which is a question mark everybody's got about him. Manawa attacked with a guillotine, couldn't get it. He... You know, lost it, gave up position, spent some time in the first round on his back, probably lost that round because of it. You know, didn't do a heck of a great job, gave up his back when trying to get up, and then again, against something against OSP, who's not a great wrestler, who's a capable wrestler, but not a great wrestler by any stretch of the imagination. 
it was a tough round for Manawa. He turned it in his favor and eventually won that fight. Looking at Corey Anderson, the guy averaged just 4.44 takedowns per fight at a 52% completion rate. He landed six against Fabio Maldonado, his UFC best. He did land five against Sean O'Connell's last matchup, four against Blakovich, four against Shogun Hua. Lots of different takedown techniques. Single leg and a trip, very effective. He'll shoot in the cage, body locks, he'll shoot from the outside, sorry. He'll land a body lock in the cage. Big slams if he can elevate his opponent. He's a very big, strong young man. He can get you to the ground in a variety of ways, basically is what I'm driving at. Once on the ground, look for him to either sit in guard, posture up, and use those long limbs to drop down ground and pound, elbows. He'll ride his opponent, stay right with him, has very good control. And, and just land strikes throughout that control time. The other, and, and that tight body control can really break guys down if you obviously go the opposite direction. The other thing he does really well is he will move to half guard. We've heard Joe talk about it a lot, where fighters move to half guard to control their opponent, land strikes. He moves to half guard, he kind of opens his opponent up, and he can control them and feed them strikes. It almost uses the mat to pin their arm down and feed them strikes from the side and really hurt guys from that position with elbows. And we saw him do that against O'Connell very effectively. Uh, the thing I like about Anderson, he doesn't let his opponents breathe. He chains his clinch to takedowns, drags them to the mat, goes to work with punches, just keeps going, overwhelms, and outworks them. He can bully them in the clinch, landing knees, short punches. He's very strong. He'll go to the double leg from that position. He'll switch to a single leg if the p- situation presents itself. But again, he's no work distance. Puts his combinations together and shoots underneath them. Again, he's melding things together, which is a key part for a young developing fighter to do everything as one unit not here's my wrestling here's my striking here's this here's that he's a very effective fighter at putting things together now on the negative side when he fought Jean Valente, Jean Valente he was getting cracked at distance he was getting his legs chewed up eventually got knocked out with a counter right hand Shogun dropped him a couple of times there are major question marks about Anderson's chin and ability to take damage if Manawa touches him on the chin he could knock him out because he has massive power the biggest question is can Jimmy Manawa stay vertical long enough to land those strikes I don't know if he can he has the power to finish anyone Anderson's chin's a question mark, but can he stay vertical? And then when he gets back vertical, will he have enough energy to actually go to work? Anderson can't spend too much time in the clinch in this fight. I think he can get, you know, land those knees. I don't care how good your cardio is. Those knees start coming to your midsection. You are in significant trouble. But I think we're going to see Corey Anderson take Manawa down, put him down, ground and pound, wear him out, ride him out. Even if they get out of the first round, you're going to see a very exhausted Jimmy Manawa, more susceptible to being taken out, uh, taken down and ground and pound. And my prediction is Corey Anderson to defeat Jimmy Manawa by TKO. So those are my four main card predictions for UFC Fight Night 107. We get I think, three weeks off after this, so certainly get you know get your money in while you can and then take a break. All of my preliminary predictions, I believe there could be eight, maybe even nine, I have to double check, available at KamikazeOverdrive.net. So certainly check that out. Very much looking forward to this card. A lot of interesting matchups, a lot of interesting betting lines. The lines have been very, you know, very solid of late. We're seeing a lot of good matchmaking overall. I know I gave him a bit of a hard time at the beginning. But a lot of good matchmaking, and it's indicative of close lines. Tight, you know, the bookmakers are saying this guy can win here, this guy can win there. This fight is up for grabs on both sides. That makes my job more difficult, picking fights. But at the same time, we're not having to take as many big risks to pull off money. Either way, if you're interested in buying the bet packs, certainly check them out. Follow me on Twitter at ko underscore predictions. I think I have 99 followers on Facebook right now. I know a lot of people don't follow my Facebook page, but you know, I'd love to see 100. So certainly, if you're a Facebook person, search me up, Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions, and. Uh, you know, enjoy the break, guys. Take care, and I'll talk to you in a couple weeks. Bye-bye.